<laughs> to do the section sometimes if like in the past it's felt forced like having to think about it like ah like oh, I don't know it became like a routine almost you know what I'm saying like oh you have to like which ain't bad hey, I was but it wasn't like ah oh, yeah this moment was joy you know what I'm saying I mean I would say that's probably sad <laughs> honestly like I think if you feel forced to sit down and think about a moment that's brought you joy either <laughs> joy is yeah, I would say either we've been conditioned to n- not search for joyous moments thus life is void of joy or your life is actually void of joy which I don't think is true I'll probably say it's the former the first part yeah, I think some of it's also around just the way it's become very, like, co-opted, liberalized, and mm-hmm. individualized, mm-hmm. you know, with, like, the propaganda machine. It's like, oh, just self-care, find your joy, find your peace. You know, just the very liberal yeah. essence was made me I mean, feel. you see, like, black black joy, black boy joy, black girl magic, all these things that are used like, uh, remember, I think we was at Target once, and it was like, black girl magic wine. It's like, what is this? Like, so wine is magical, like poison is magical. <laughs> I mean, but also, if we look at the con- the real material conditions of black girls, of black women in this country, whether it be literacy rates, whether it be sterilization, whether it be jail, whether it be victims of domestic violence, whether it be poverty rates, uh, the magic is not in the wine. That's not going to liberate them. You know, black boy joy, if you look at the rate, of uh, literacy rate for black boys, incarceration, suspended from school, um, poverty, uh, the likelihood of going to jail, right? Violence, like, oh, what is black boy joy? If the highest level of black joy, is sovereignty, <laughs> sovereignty. But we can still sovereignty. look for. I mean, uh, you know, we ain't free right now, and I st- I definitely got a lot of black joy. Oh yeah, no, I have a lot of. Yeah. I, I do too. New African joy. And then it's like, what is black? I mean, it's just all a byproduct of our political education. It's yeah, like, I just, uh, I, I'm not on no pessimistic stuff when I say uh, it's not like a pessimistic, like depressive, like uh-huh. type of attitude when I say that it felt it's felt forced. It's more so, I think, just the conditions. I guess you maybe say. we should call it something else. I mean, but black joy is something that I think resonates with the masses of people. Yeah. You know, we can do black joy, new African joy, black in parentheses. <laughs> Yeah. Cause people been hitting me Hey when y'all gonna bring this back Man it's been four episodes Three strikes y'all out man What's going on But I mean It's a new episode of Hella Black I mean, We can't let four people determine A segment though That's also another thing <laughs> no, it's <was> like <laughs> Cause when we was telling people like, Oh send us y'all black joy shit Like we tried to make we it We try and then excuse people, me. people don't go on our Patreon Interactive and stuff Even if it's not on Patreon We also was like Hit us in the tweets And all these things Like it's gonna take more than four people For me to start Exposing your joy Doing the whole segment But I'm That's neither here nor there If you wanna do it I'm with it I have enough joyous moments No I've had some very to talk about Joyous moments As well My recent Findings of joy <laughs> has been through none other than barbecuing. Mm-hmm. Or shall I say smoking? Shout out to that Hawaii smoke, you know what I'm saying? But nah, I've been finding a balance. And I think through finding more balance, I found more joy, you know, and just like a process of like cooking and barbecuing, especially smoking, it's like a longer process of cooking mm-hmm. and you have to have a lot of like patience. So I've been finding joy in cooking. Eating well and feeding other people. Mm-hmm. That's my. Look at we got joy right here. Look at this man right in the plant. You got your plant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the halal smoke has also been bringing me joy. It's fire. I want to. I was thinking I need to learn how to. I knew how to grill. We had barbecue club in high school, so like I knew how to grill, but I stepped away from it. But yeah, you can see. You know, niggas been watching a lot more like barbecue shows and shit. <laughs> so I would say it, it is like a positive way to spend your time. You know, yeah, I think it's positive in a lot of ways too. Because you know, for people who ain't even familiar with like what halal is, like mm-hmm. what halal food is too, it's also like being able to like teach people around like what this means. You know what I'm saying? Versus not halal food. You know what I'm saying? Like the blood is drained, it's hand slaughtered, organic. 
free range, you know what I'm saying, prayed over and stuff. So I think it's also been like that's been a dope part of like people asking me like what does that mean? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And just like thinking about like how we eat as well. You know it all, what I'm it like showed me very, how very intentional yeah. as well that you have to be too, because it's like, oh, you know, I might go to the butcher and it's like they have what is available there. You mm-hmm. feel me? So it also makes you think about like, you know, sometimes just the way like globalization of food has made it like instant access for every single type of food possible, especially for us living in the so-called West in America. You know, it's it's also showing me like, okay, you know, maybe the food is based off of like what was actually killed or what was actually closely farmed. You know what I'm saying? To where it's like, okay, no, you actually only have uh, a few options today. You know, it might just be you might have a ribeye you can get. All right, well, maybe you might be able to get a brisket one day, then you might not be able to the next day. You might be able to get a tri-tip one week, then mm-hmm. the next week you might not be able to get one. So it's kind of taught me like it's made me just think more intentionally. You know, around like food, especially we as we know, food is a weapon. You know, mm-hmm. so I see like, okay, you can eat good, you can eat healthy, um, and it'd be wild, you know, and be, so I think that's something that's been bringing me joy as well, is like thinking about just more of this intentional process of food. Yeah, the halal, you uh, consuming halal food has shown me just how difficult it is to even locate it, you know, like, I was at, I was somewhere, I was trying to get the halal wings for the birthday party and just it didn't exist <laughs> where I was at. Um, yeah, and so realizing how difficult it is to access healthy foods <laughs> is is insane. And we talk a lot, talk a lot about that through uh, like our grocery program and our and our uh, our farming. Realizing like you know the quote unquote food deserts that exist, um, but even if you are someone who has the ability to travel to purchase food you realize how difficult it, how far you got to go um so that's one thing i noticed and then also to your point where if you think about it excuse me if you go back centuries food was pretty much localized until you have like railroads put into place to where now you're connecting you know the east to the west and the north to the south right uh but because of this uh i guess like yeah, because of uh, advances in technology and making things like easily accessible, we don't even start to think how food is impacted when it has to travel from Idaho to Maine, from Florida to Oregon, and what is used to preserve that food. Or even you see sometimes meats, it's like he getting meat from like Thailand, beef. <laughs> beef New Zealand, you can yeah, you can beef and ground beef from six Isn't different countries, crazy? bro. So it's like you literally have no idea if it's this is like six different cows you were actually eating at one time. Like that is very. But we don't even stop to think about it because of what accessibility. Oh no, accessibility and then oh price. Like oh, we just gonna eat this. Like I mean, some people don't have the choice. That's what's so wild. Yeah, you know? no, for real. Like what? What? How would you eat? If, you know, you only had to rear these two cows or these chickens, right? Like, even the way that you will consume, it would be on a what I need versus what I want. Like, so much of our life is governed by what we desire mm-hmm. versus, like, what do you actually need to be satiated? And that's what I learned through Ramadan. Like, it's crazy how I'm, or it's wild how I'm starting to, the other day I was like, oh, I'm so hungry. Of course, in Ramadan, you slow down, but I was like, oh, my God, I'm so hungry. It's like... No, I can not. go sixteen hours without food. <laughs> I can go sixteen hours without food. I don't necessarily need food, but again, it's uh, how it's here in America. A lot of the propaganda, so much of the media, is always about getting what you want, getting whenever. what you desire, whenever you want it, uh, versus really thinking like, what do I actually need? Like, why am I consuming this food? Like, if you start to think about why you're eating, what you're eating for, it would have changed the way you approach everything, right? If I'm eating for fuel, if I'm eating uh, mostly for fuel. If I'm eating to feel good afterwards, it's mm-hmm. going to change the way you eat. But, you know, they don't want us to be critical thinkers here. Because once you start thinking about one thing, you start thinking about, about all things. All, you know? <laughs> so. But that's why I realize once you have, like, discipline with food, too, you know, because I've been, like, strictly halal for a bit now. And, like, just having that discipline of, like, okay, this is what I'm about to put in my body. Like, and then making those adjustments, like, all right, if I'm traveling, like, you know, it might not always be access. All right, I'm going to have to adjust my diet. But still having, like, that discipline, mm-hmm. like, it's helped me in er- other areas of my life, you know, um, when I've had that discipline with food. Like, okay, this is, like, like you was talking about working out. If I'm not working out, why do I need to eat the same way I ate last night? Mm-hmm. I worked out for two and a half hours 
yesterday, so I'm going to need to eat a lot more to re- refill my body and for mm-hmm. my body to be able to build back up. But if I ain't uh, eat or if I ain't working out, why would I eat the same way? You know? So I was like, eating to match our lifestyle versus eating just to consume and overconsume. The diet, look at the West. You feel me? Like, look at, like, in general, like the way food is being weaponized against our, our people. Yeah, and, and our bodies full and our minds. <laughs> docile. <laughs> Bruh, for real. Like you come on, like it's uh, Sometimes they bring out food and I'm like, like this could literally be cut in half. <laughs> it can literally be cut in half. Like you why is this even offered you know, in this size? Bro, like my, just the most insane things possible in the West. Like that's that's the West. It just tries to make everything as extravagant as possible. Like, but at what cost? The cost of your, your health. <laughs> the cost of yourself. The, the cost of your well-being. The cost of your people's well-being. The cost of the planet's well-being mm-hmm. as well. Because if we think about, like you was talking about, like the way foods is shipped and this, you know, uh, imperialist economy. You feel me? It's like the food is more localized. The environment would be better. We and all this about, shit take hella energy to transport. You know slaughter like mass slaughter like, like imagine okay energy. we have like farms in every city farms in every locale and it's really on some farm to table versus you know obviously there's certain things we're going to need to track as certain regions of course they're going to grow certain things that, mm-hmm. you know so of course there's going to be uh you know some economic uh interdependence between different locales and whatnot but food interdependence rather yeah. you know <laughs> wow yeah, that's, that, that's that's that uh, <laughs> Ujama agriculture you know what that Julius Nairi was talking about, man. Come on, every every backyard should have a little planter box, a little farm. Every neighborhood should have one. Every school should have one. But you know, we'll, we'll get there so when we long. when we uh, ultimately get control of our own destinies and of our own lives. That's what it's all about. That's Dialect. what building a nation is. Building a nation is allowing you to uh, consciously contribute to the governing of your life. Step by step, C by C. Brick by brick. <laughs> yeah. I would say what's brought me some joy is just spending time with my family. Of course, like everyone else in this world who was impacted by COVID. Um, I th- my family was one that spent a lot of time together. As much as we could, we was always having some sort of family get together, some party, some holidays. Uh, and yeah, that was just halted with COVID. And then you have this generation of youth who are all working in different fields right to where you have my you have family that a lot of my cousins work in sectors that cost them to travel and to be like bi-coastal and stuff Uh, and then you have parts of my family that have been impacted by gentrification so pushed out and can't afford to live here right so you just have us all very spread out uh, but I would say over the last like six months, it's been a group effort to spend more time together. Uh, and yeah, something I value and appreciate, you know, rereading uh, Meditations on Wretched of the Earth by James Jockey Sills. And he talks about us new Africans beginning to model the familial structure of uh Europeans of colonizers, you know, like you would grow up and you would mm-hmm. see like Europeans and Euro Americans, they really just be focusing on like that nucleus, like th- the mom, dad, and brother and sister, and like that's all like media household. They would be acting hella weird toward their cousins and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, that's my half sister. That's my. I remember one time somebody told you that was my half brother. I'm like, nigga, what? <laughs> <laughs> I took it as like pure. Dis- but you, that just shows you how they view family. You know, like they just I don't know and. As a result of us, right, Fanon says no one can be in a society and not be of it. As new Africans constantly being subjected to social, economic, and political institutions that not that are not for us, thus culture that is not for us, uh, we sometimes unconsciously adopt that model. And then when you take into consideration us no longer having the means to actually even uh, congregate and live near one another how we used to, right, Oakland being in the, at its height. I believe in like 87, 47% black, something like that, right? And when I was growing up in Oakland, uh, having like, you know, I lived on 47th. My grandma lived on 54th. My dad lived on 50, 52nd. 
And in the north, it goes from 47th to 51st. So that's two blocks away from me, right? Just uh, like jump over. My right dad right and my right. aunt live in two blocks away from me. Uh, my other grandma lived on 65th, right? So this is like Playground my entire it. family <laughs> living in a 10 block radius yeah. where I'm walking and riding my bike. And so all these things have just led to uh, us being separated, culture, and then the economic situation. Um, but, you know, we bringing that shit back. And so I'm. I'm juice, man. man. Be- town shit, man. Well, yeah. <laughs> when you able to look at your self, right, as like the inner revolution that you age and see the growth that you make, and then when you're able to see that kind of transcend yourself and spread into your tribe, your, your immediate community, your broader community, this is why I have so much faith in the Repub- Republic of New Africa. Because I see, it in my, I see it in my everyday life. It's a beautiful life. thing. I see it in my everyday Beautiful life, you know? Day, bro. Yeah. It'd be wild, though. You feel me? You see, like, the decisions you make and then how the decisions you make then influence the decisions of other people or, like, can help change other people. You know what I'm saying? Or help bring other people together. Like, that's... And those the internal struggle is difficult. That's what I would say. It's beautiful because it's a struggle. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable struggle, but that un- uncomfortable struggle you know, lays a foundation for something beautiful. Yeah, it, and it's, it starts with self because once you start doing that inner work... And breaking free of the matrix, uh, you want to bring as many people with you. I think that's just the very African thing to do. Like I think that's the African worldview. Like we are a communal people. Excuse me. But I also think that's the very revolutionary humanist thing to do. Is when you find something that adds value, adds value to your life. Excuse me. Yeah. You ain't supposed to just hold on to it. You try to share it with as many people as possible. Lock it you know? in the safe. You no, know, it's supposed to be unlocked and share with the rest of humanity. Yeah, you try That's to share it with as many people as possible. So, I think as we've been able to get uh, creative with our own lives, you know, we try to share that with other people. That's why you see, okay, now you cooking for people's birthdays parties. You know, I'm planning family vacations, and if I can get people to come together to do shit like get high and drunk, I got to be able to get people to come together to do better things. You know, if I'm with my, you know, I was doing a lot of things with, with people that was detri- that was uh, detrimental to our well-being, you know, and it wasn't my intent to be detrimental to myself or to them, right? But mm-hmm. uh, it's just the culture that we live in where you consume, you drink, you I smoke, mean, you snort without thinking, you pop, you know, and that's just, and so I, I We've been talking, we're going to talk about this now with this episode about sacrifices and uh, discipline and determination, right? But I believe us as new Africans, we just don't have any time to waste uh, with not taking control. And what George Jackson says, seizing the, you know, grabbing the bull by the horns. I think we got to look for as much control as we can in our lives. And once we get that control, we want all of it in every sector. Government, <laughs> agriculture, we want all education. It. You feel me? Like once I got to control of this, I won't control man. everything. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and not to be a tyrant or to be a dictator, Bro, but to actually control. have control. You're talking about people. You're mm-hmm. talking about <laughs> Delancey. You talk about the new African. Nation I want mass control. control. I want mass control. And right now, we do not have that. We do not have mass control. And not so at all. That's what we organizing for. Hella Black new episode. Subscribe Patreon.com backslash Hella Black Pod. Go to our YouTube, uh, search Hello Black. That's trash. Hello Black so, Pie. You know, go go. What's to our that? YouTube yeah. channel? <laughs> YouTube, you go search Hello Black Pie. I know y'all know where it's at. You feel me? Search that Hello Black. How Podcast, many subscribers do we have? That. We only have two thousand. We only have twenty six hundred subscribers. We Dude, need more than that, y'all. Y'all be listening, but not subscribing enough. You feel me? So be sure to subscribe. You know what I'm saying? Especially, I ain't too many of y'all who are patrons. The least y'all could do is subscribe. So this is me. Tell y'all to stop what you was doing. Pull over on the side of the road if you're listening to this in the car. Don't text and drive. Don't don't subscribe and drive. But tap in with our YouTube. Tap in with our Apple Podcast, Spotify. If you got a few dollars to spend, you feel me to help with production costs? Go to patreoncom slash pot But yeah, hello black. We got a good episode in store today, and an important episode. I like to say all of our episodes are important. But this one feels very timely. Mm-hmm. It's always timely. Every day this episode, you know, the, the content of this is timely. Like you were saying before, like we got to have that uh, understanding of time. I mean, we got to do it fast. We got to have mm-hmm. a sense of urgency with, mm-hmm. within the struggle, you know. So this is a urgent topic. Uh, that urgency urgent thing also. for us to have a, a understanding and overstanding of as well. 
if that that uh, urgency is a byproduct of knowing one's history and so giving folks a little history lesson today um for those i'm sure i mean if you're a listener of hella black an avid listener of hella black you are aware of um the influence that the black panther party the republic of new africa and the black liberation army the Malcolm X grassroots movement, the New African People's Organization, has had on our work, and so you should be familiar with who uh, Matulu, Doctor Matulu Shakur is, who passed away last week, on Juma on Friday, last Friday. Yeah, yeah, this past Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we want to spend some time today talking about Doctor Matulu Shakur, uh, and this idea of martyrdom of revolutionary suicide and of using everything at your disposal for the betterment of humanity and a part of that process of bettering the humanity for new Africans, for black people, is new African independence movement and uh, revolutionary nationalism. First, we got to start with who is Dr. Matulu Shakur? Honestly, I feel like... It's very hard to describe. You can you can't just in a few minutes give an introduction to Dr. Matul Shakur. You know everything he has done for the people, everything he has sacrificed, uh, his his willful sacrifice, his uh, intentional sacrifice for the people. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like words can't do it justice, in my opinion. The yeah, best justice would be our action, which mm-hmm. we'll definitely talk about later, right? Our action in terms of building programs and building the new African nation. You know what I'm saying? But Dr. Matul Shakur. Uh, new African, a Muslim, uh, revolutionary, you feel me, a part of a variety of different organizations over the years. Uh, father to Tupac Shakur, some might say stepfather, but we know the Shakur family, they see themselves as family, ain't no, <laughs> ain't no half-stepping with that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, father, grandfather, part of the uh, RAM, the Revolutionary Armed Task Force, the BLA, the RNA, you know what I'm saying? So we think about all the organizations he's influenced and played a, a part in over the years. You feel me? He has been a part of this generational struggle. The Shakur family in general has been a part of every significant organization, black organization, new African organization. Uh, you feel me? From the UNIA to, to the RNA, Shakur, mm-hmm. and Matuba Shakur is, is a part of that. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Uh, architect, an architect of thug life. You know what I'm saying? When you hear Tupac Shakur talking about thug life, you feel me? He was the architect of the of the code of conduct. You feel me? Um, led truces between you know Crips and Bloods. You feel me? All from behind bars. Like Matuba to me was a man who was very selfless. You know what I'm saying? In terms of like, hey, it don't gotta be me, but you know you gonna you gonna feel me even if you don't know what's coming from me. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? <laughs> like behind the scenes in some degree. You know. Um, being incarcerated, his impact from behind bars is something that is almost immeasurable, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Uh, he's an acupuncturist, you know what I'm saying? Like, a real doctor. That's why, like, you really study these people's lives, you know what I'm saying, what they've contributed to the struggle in their time period and what they've done from being a part of revolutionary organizations to him being a doctor of acupuncture and going to school at the same time as making all these contributions to the people and to the organizations he was a part of mm-hmm. and to the movement in general. It's like, that to me just tells me, I like, tighten up. <laughs> you feel me? We can, you know, these folks have been doing so much work, having to, you know, balance some nine to five job, doing them clinical type of work and still struggling alongside the people and using the skills that they got from whatever institution it was, whether it be acupuncture, or not, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and then bringing that to the people, right? He's bringing detox. He was talking about the chemical warfare. He was talking about the uh, warfare of food. You feel me? Mm-hmm. He was talking about chemical warfare. We understand that the United States government, the, the CIA, the Cocaine Intelligence Agency, the U.S. You know, uh, military forces, you know, smuggling in drugs and, and bringing it back into the community and poisoning our people. Dr. Matul found a way to detox the people. You know what I'm saying? Like to set up a detox clinic and to uh, start a whole method that is credited to him. You feel me? The Nada method, right? So, like, we're talking about a holistic revolutionary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> People talk about holistic, man. Holistic in every aspect from organizing gangs to, you feel me, allegedly, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> get, get, getting down, getting busy, you know what I'm saying? saying? Being literally like the Rico. You know, oftentimes we hear about Rico, we think about the mafia or the mob. It's like he was charged with Rico. 
You feel me? Mm-hmm. Like, so he, you know, uh, gives a shining example of what it means to be a new African. Uh, a shining example of what it means to be a Muslim. A shining example of what it means to be a, a soldier for the people, a soldier for the new African independence movement. And I don't mean soldier just as in the uh, engaging in, in quote unquote armed warfare, but a soldier in terms of <laughs> providing free health care to the people, getting people off of uh, drugs and helping them detox. You know what I'm saying? Uh, raising a family, even from behind bars, uh, uh, giving revolutionary ethics uh, to Tupac and influencing Tupac's music that has transformed a lot of people's lives. You know, so I, I consider him to uh, be one of our greats. <laughs> one of our greats for sure. Uh, I almost can, you know, we'll get into it a little more later, but consider him to be a a martyr for the movement. If we understand the way that uh, our health our health can be deteriorated by being behind bars. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Uh, so, yeah, long live the spirit of Dr. Matula Shakur. Hopefully we could do our best to, to honor him, not only <laughs> in this episode, but through our work of building the cadre organization, through our work in the new African independence movement. Yeah, I mean, you've already, in addition to that being a, a great uh, introduction into into his work, we could never do it justice, uh, ever. Uh, just because the only things we know are what's been told to us by other people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I've only had the chance to hear him speak live once, and that was when he was fresh home. And for like a brief, like one or two minutes, maybe a few minutes, you know, so it's all the work that we are seeing have been have has been told through uh you know second or third parties, uh, but he he is someone that I believe we can all uh, model our lives after anyone that's you know if you needed a revolutionary role model that's somebody that you could turn to w- without question, especially as you say he uh, used whatever skills he had if that was acupuncture, um, if it was ethics and getting people to abide by a certain code he used we whatever he could to build the nation master plans to yeah. free us out of allegedly you know? yeah a lot, a lot of respect uh, and love for him and like you said the best we could do is uh, speak life into him right as much as we can and honor him through the actual programming that's the the best way uh, yeah. yeah to keep his legacy going I mean, he's without a doubt had a big influence on both of us, probably before we even knew. Yeah. If I'm listening <laughs> to Tupac as a knew, kid. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think about, like, literally having one of them first, you know, Tupac CDs that um, I got. My, it was, like, the explicit version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember just first, the first time really, like, sitting in my room, like, listening to it. And then my mom heard it and said, oh, you got to take it back. <laughs> she let me go get the clean version. But, like, even there. Yeah. I'm being impacted by Matula without even knowing it. You feel me? Then I get older and get the consciousness. But okay, it's you feel me? Yeah, it's but my impact. freshman year of college is when I like really, really got into Tupac. Like of course, you know, you growing up in Oakland, my dad in the music, like you know who Tupac is, but it's something about using him as a guide to get through life when you are eighteen in college in these dorms and you up in Humboldt. It's you dealing with all types of shit. You know, like you on your excuse me, you on your own trying to figure out life. And so if Tupac is guiding me and the Shakur family are the ones who've guided Tupac, then, you know, the Black Panther Party has been influencing me for a a very long time. Then, of course, my fucking grandma and my uncle, you know, so, yeah. But, um, yeah, the Shakur family has influenced our work. The first book we read as Cadre was Asada's Autobiography. Boom. <laughs> feel me like that was the first book that People's Programs Cadre has ever read and still currently starts 2016? with 2016? Yeah. yeah. And we still, still still start with that book. Anytime we launch a new uh, internal PE cadre, Asada Shakur is the first book we read. Mm-hmm. Um, we just did a recent podcast that drops tomorrow or, well, I don't yeah drops this week um, on the legacy of, of Tupac Shakur trying to right some of the wrongs that uh, mass media propaganda has done against him and uh, bashing his name and his character. Uh, and then, yeah, Afeni, Lumumba, 
Zayd, Sanyika. Like these are all you know the, the Shakur family. Abu Shakur, <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah. long legacy. And these are people who we've like who I know you and I have have studied individually, and thus it's going to impact the organization. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then you look at Matulu's work, which you mentioned with the um, Lincoln Detox Center, uh, with, with, and over in, in the Bronx uh, with the Young Lords, right? Um, that has directly impacted the work that the People's Programs. Uh, free health clinic is doing right um we have a piece that was published in our blog uh i mean i mean i know it's i'm not gonna try to guess the word the title but it was written by we have two separate pieces written by uh both a b and raven the first one is wait, let me pull up my medium where is this hold on writing it's like i organized oh here we go all right this is why you need a producer, dog. But let me pull it up. Here we go. Dope is death. Acupuncture heals. That is by A B. You should check that out. A look at how uh, the work of Matulu and Nada and the Young Lords and the Detox Clinic influences uh, the work that we're doing at People's Programs. And then Chemical Warfare, uh, written by Raven, gives you some of the historical context that Abbas was talking about as it pertains to the uh, CIA transporting drugs. Or trafficking drugs <laughs> um, into the United States and specifically uh, into these uh, urban areas as a means to uh, attack the black power movement, right? And so read those two pieces, Chemical Warfare and um, Dope is Death, Acupuncture Heals, right? Those give you a direct insight into how the work of Matulu Shakur and the Lincoln Detox Center impacts the work of people's programs. And I think lastly, from for myself, uh, the Shakur family's approach to self determination and providing for the people has directly impacted me. Um, you know, I read Monster earlier this year by Sanyika, and some of those last chapters where he talks about um, being politicized, right, uh, and starting to yeah, shift and change his life. Uh, you see him really just talk a lot about determination, you know, uh, and then you know, with Pac listening to, you know, a lot of his music uh, in those last interviews once he's released from uh, Clinton Correctional Facility and, and, and talking about how, what he wants to do and, and some of the organizing work that he wants to do uh, and then reading Asana Shakur's autobiography, right? Like you just uh, – they have a lot of strength and heart and they were willing to do whatever it took uh, to take care of the people. And that's something that I try to embody um, every single day to the best of my ability. And so I, I really can't thank the Shakur family enough uh, for the influence they've had on me as an individual and trying to take that individual uh, influence and work that into the culture and processes of people's programs yeah the Shakur family shows us what a new African family can and should look like showing a commitment to struggle no matter the generation you feel me each generation must pick up the torch and it just shows us the way family can be seen as you know oftentimes it's uh, only seen as all oh, blood mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying but Tupac, you feel me, viewed as Asada as his auntie, as his godma. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you ain't, that's family. <laughs> like, this conception of family and this conception of choosing to struggle under, like, uh, a certain mode of ethics, a certain uh, way of struggle. You know what I'm saying? That's what the Shakur household, you feel me, chose to do. So I think that just shows us, like, the ways we could intentionally build and the way we can intentionally struggle as a new African tribe, as a new African nation, mm -hmm. and how... It's important to have that family structure as well. You feel me? And not the quote unquote nuclear family of the West, but we see time and time again through each decade, through each generation, how a Shakur has risen. A Shakur has has worked to fight against capitalist imperialism. You feel me? You don't get a Tupac without a Matulu. You don't get a Tupac without a Afini, without a Lumumba, <laughs> without a Abba Shakur. You feel me? Mm -hmm. It's the way it's transformed from each generation. You know, so for me, that makes that's just like a lesson on familyhood. 
building a strong family so the struggle can continue. You feel me? So that struggle can keep living on. You feel me? Until our people are free. And that's just a very inherent African thing to do. Uh, if you look at the concept of tribes in African tradition where, you know, it was not like, oh, that's so-and-so's baby. Like, that's our baby. That's the village's baby. Um, and we got to get back to that because the way that we've been taught to engage each other, it's, it's a European it's way. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a colonial way. I'm even reading this book right now, uh, Empire of the Summer Moon or something. Let's talk about the uh, Comanches, right? But in, in in the early chapters, they were talking about like the settlers that was sent, and just you know, like they would essentially just like send their people off to die. Like you go out to the new frontier, you feel me? With like nothing. That's a very European way, a Euro American way of looking at life. To where it's like, hey, if y'all go out there and make some shake, it's cool. But really, we just sending y'all out to die. You know, and you look at the way Europeans, uh, you know, before they was enslaving us, they was enslaving each other. And like in nasty ways, you know what I'm saying? Not the ways that African tribes would go to war and uh, take prisoners of war and then raise the prisoners of war as part of the tribe now. And no, nah, no, nah, they was enslaving. They was enslaving each other uh, in very volatile ways. And so, any like we just got to reject all European culture. But it's hard when they've been able to manipulate European culture into making it seem like it's a new African culture. So that's why you got to know your history. It's you got to, <laughs> you got to know your history. If I uh, Read how Europe underdeveloped Africa, and it gives you a little bit of insight into um, those African empires that existed in African culture that existed pre-contact uh, with with the Europeans, right? Where you get uh, the Dahomey uh, in modern day Benin, you get the uh, Ghana Kingdom in modern day Mali, you get uh, Songhai in modern day Mali, you get the Gold Coast in modern day Ghana. You get uh, Canem in modern day Chad. You get Takwer in modern day Senegal. Like, look at how these, you feel me, how we act and look at the culture that was produced to these people. Uh, and I will also say shit beyond Bilal, even if it is a, a, uh, a look at black Islamic history, but you look at some of these cultures and how we act. You look at having three quarters of the empire. <laughs> you feel me? But, you look, but in those books, they talk yeah. about how we, inter- how uh, culture is a byproduct of who governs the nation. And look at how we interacted with each other. It was very humanistic and not this reactionary humanistic where mm-hmm. you talk civil and human rights, but you push an exploitive system, right? Like, I would just say, y'all, these are two books that come to my mind uh, to where you can start to look at some of the ways that we engage with each other. It's not about going back to that type of way. It's about bringing that worldview. That so understanding that history so you can move forward. I want for you what I want for me uh, yeah. so that we can figure out how to bring that to life in this 21st century. And it shows you we've done it before. So now let's learn from the contradictions of the past <laughs> and move it forward to establish the new African nation. But that's mm-hmm. what we have to do. We have to understand history so we can apply it to our current. Then our current allows us, uh, if we understand the past and we can apply it to our current, then that allows us to become future focused. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Because if we ain't thinking <laughs> generations ahead of us, well, what are we doing right now? Are we, is we truly preparing for the next generations behind us if we ain't preparing for the future? I mean, it's like what, what what Malcolm said. Who taught you to hate yourself? And we should ask who who taught us to live this way. Like, who taught us to live? Whose culture is this? Who taught us to live this way? Who taught us to think this way? Whose who culture? Even when we talk way? about like black culture, what is black culture? That's a whole other podcast. But we just want to get y'all to get y'all minds thinking. Like, who taught you to eat like this? To think like this? To move like this? Right. Yeah. Uh, but on the, getting back to the topic at hand, uh, we posed. You spoke on something earlier around wanting to honor uh, Matulu and all those we have lost um, as martyrs to the movement, as people who consciously went out to change the world around them and uh, specifically make a, a better life for new Africans, right? And so how can we as individuals and as a Kaju organization uh, honor our martyrs like a Matulu? I want to say look at Matulu's life and look out at how he struggled. Like, he struggled a certain way. He decided to struggle. He he made a commitment to struggle, even if that meant, you know, him living, losing his life, even if that meant uh, him being locked up for most of his life, right? Uh, he made that commitment to the people. Uh, he removed that fear from his heart and said, I, I believe in, in God and God alone, and I believe in the freedom for humanity, and I'm going to fight. <laughs> I'm going to fight with every ounce of my being to do so. So the one way... Mutuba, he already lives on. He already lives on. But the way he, he keeps living is by following his spirit. 
by following the the, the decisions he made, uh, by avenging him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's the best way we honor our martyrs is to avenge the oppressors who oppressed Mutubu, to uh, establish justice, to uh, abolish tyranny, <laughs> to abolish oppression. Right? That's the way we uh, best honor our martyrs, our, our fallen soldiers, right? And I'm not just talking about the individual CO or the individual cop. I'm talking about the system that produces the COs, the system that produces the cops, the system that uh, brought us here, the, uh, the the people who still benefit from the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, right? I'm talking about this whole system of capitalist imperialism. That's how we avenge our martyrs. That's how we best do it. Now, day to day, that's struggling with yourself making that internal changes but also being a part of a, a cadre organization who was Matua a part what was Matua a part of throughout his life cadre organizations mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, one might have you feel me not ceased to exist and then he joined another <laughs> you know what I'm saying so join an organization is how you join an organization that is doing real work if you don't have an organization doing work in your locale build it build it create it you feel me have a material program Right, uh, shift the material reality of the of your people's lives. Uh, that's how we we honor them. It's through our work. It's through our actions. Right, and making that uh, commitment, because that's what it comes from. Commitment. We got to have a commitment and have an internal discipline, uh, internal fortitude that we ain't finna compromise. <laughs> we ain't finna compromise. But two never compromised. Mm-hmm. Our martyrs never compromised. You know, so to honor them is to avenge them. <laughs> And, and, you know, not just this, uh, go, you know, people might hear that and be like, oh, just go, you know, third phase and <laughs> just war right away. But mm-hmm. it's that day to day practice and it's that day to day practice of building a program so we can actually secure the land, so that we can actually uh, secure the Republic of New Africa. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's how I would say our, our martyrs live on. That's how our, our fallen soldiers live on is through through our day to day actions. They already live in, but now it's. Let's, let's, you feel me? Let's take that energy because, in many ways, I would say it's the it's our martyrs that allow us to struggle, right? It's our martyrs who are at the foundation of this, this, these movements because without the the bloodshed of our martyrs, we wouldn't know how to struggle. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have that sense of purpose. We wouldn't have that example, you know. Of uh, of freedom uh, of trying to become independent, you know what I'm saying? Like even if we look at like uh, in Algeria, for example, right? The all the martyrs of that, right? Uh, who you know took violent means to free the land from the French. You feel me? That installed a certain spirit within the struggle of Africans throughout the continent. You know what I'm saying? If we think about France Fanon going to the All African People's Conference and saying on violence, where did he learn on violence from Algeria? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you feel me? Where did that concept of violence come from it came from martyrs saying no nah, we is going to fight by any means necessary even if that results in our death and then that spirit phenon spread through the all african people's conference then the african continent in general moved towards independence then that spirit moved to the black panther party that spirit moved through malcolm mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying so the foundation is our martyrs so how are we going to honor them is the question that we have to ask ourselves are we going to honor them or are we going to just say oh those are our martyrs and that's that or are we going to say oh no we should live like how they lived we should remove fear from our hearts we should stand up straight head high no matter what and then struggle against all odds against these euro americans against capitalist imperialism uh, that's what i would say i agree but how do we develop this uh you know sophia bakari she talks about like this spirit of struggle you know what i'm saying within our people all right how do we continue this spirit of struggle you know and how do our, our martyrs fit into that? And our fallen soldiers fit into that? I think me and you have talked about it a little bit throughout this episode is what has allowed us to uh, further entrench ourselves and deepen our commitment is by learning about the people who did it before us, right? So that sometimes you get a story of engraved detail, like a revolution, like a revolutionary suicide, which is the autobiography of Huey P. Newton, or you get This Side of Glory, the autobiography of David Hillier, right, who is the uh, chief of staff of the Black Panther Party. Or you get it in small tidbits, like uh, The War Before with Sophia Bakari in one of her essays, and she talks about being captured in uh, Virginia, and she alludes, and she mentions uh, comrades Maasai and Kambozi, right? Um, Kambozi was shot and then stumped to death by the clerks, right, in the store. 
Um, and then I believe had his body cremated before his mom could even identify it. You know what I'm saying? And so when you learn these stories on both a grand dose and very small scales, like how I personally feel I cannot speak to the Republic of New Africa, the New African Independence Movement, and then not try my best given the context of my life. Now, that doesn't mean I have to go out and be Kambozi. It doesn't mean I have to be Maasai. It doesn't mean I have to be Hillier. It doesn't mean I have to be Bukhari. It doesn't mean I have to be any of the Shakurs. But like, what is my maximum contribution to this thing if I'm gonna keep talking about it? What are the things that I can do given the context of my life, right? Being a historical dialectical materialist, using that methodology, what can I do in the context of my life? And I believe that you start to ask, what can I do when you start to understand what's been done? So first and foremost, uh, how we develop the spirit of struggle is by truly knowing our history. This is why they give us reduced stories of history every day. This is why they give us warped versions of history every day because they want you to follow a very specific path. This is why you don't get, they, they hardly show you the clip of Martin Luther King saying uh, to tell a bootless man to pick himself up by his bootstraps to free a people and give them no economic base. They don't show you those clips. Because when King was talking that shit, what is he talking? Sovereignty, nationalism. That's, no economic beast talking nationalism. They don't show you that clip, right? Uh, this is why they give, uh, why they why they'll show Malcolm, right? Well, they'll make a movie about Bob Marley, but not tell you that Bob Marley was killed by the CIA. This is why they'll do this documentary on Tupac Shakur and paint him to be this crazy lost kid, right? Because they want you to see history in a very specific way. In a warped view, that will. That's why they give you honest aid. That's why they give you honest aid. <laughs> This is why they, you know, this is why they, this is why they give you these warped versions of history. This is why they give you these stories of inclusion, right? Uh, because you, they want you to model your life in a very specific way. So us as cadres, we have to do the revolutionary cadre. We have to do the grandos job of preventing objective revolutionary history to the people, and that understanding this what's happened with us we got objective revolutionary history i tell you like read this story about this person you tell me read this story about this person what happens we like oh that's how you post live everybody all humans we, need mentorship adjustments. All, all <laughs> everyone needs mentorship bro period point blank right and so uh with a lot of our mentors being locked up and i say the new african revolutionaries who are still behind bars uh or we have to, we have to, those that are out here wandering the extended plantation, we have to do the best we can to uh, give our people objective versions of history. Uh, and with this, you create the conditions for each individual to start to wonder, what can I do to get involved? What what can I do? That's how we started, right? What do we say? We read Huey P. Newton. What can, oh shit, what can I do? All right, we know the breakfast program. We know some of that history. Like, we read right. Asada. And then we see him, people out living in the streets. It was like, all right, maybe it's not in the schools. And we just start with the houses camps first. And that might be a good way to get people to come out and organize because people see this and people want to make a change. So we'll start right here. So if that happens for us. Dialectical it, and historical materialism. If that happened for us, well, that's going to happen for other people. You if you, that's, that's how the cadre has grown. What do we do? We introduce history, correct history to the rest of the to the rest of people we came in contact with. And that's how cadres are built. That's how you get cadre one, cadre two, cadre three. Uh, hundreds of volunteers with the conditions of you know con continuing to grow this organization uh, but that all came through understanding our history and once folks understand their history they want to figure out how they can get involved in a real way um, and yeah I would say lastly the key, one of the key elements of understanding one's history is it puts and you talk about this all the time putting it puts your own struggles into context where it's how can I feel so like, bro, the more and more I learn history, the less and less sorry I feel for myself every single day, no matter what, it, what no matter what comes up against me. It's like, how can you complain when this happened? And it's not to erase what I feel. It yeah, just puts it in context. Like, because it they, puts it in context and it makes you your issues not seem like it's the end of the end world. Of the world. <laughs> because what is they? Yeah. Th there's a reason why. This mass media, they do a good job of making you feel like everything is fatal. They want you to be pessimistic. Mm -hmm. They don't, they take a hit, they take a loss. They don't, they, what right. they do, they reconvene. You get the G20, the G7, NATO, AFRICOM, whenever they, they go they and figure, figure it, out. it out. They're gonna adjust. It's never fatal for them. Failure is never fatal. And then the United States fails all the time. But they reconvene. They figure out where to contain it. The colonizer, the colonizer failed all the time. This is what you was out, out. On you was out somewhere, and what you seen them having a conference about how to address 
a uh, contradictory force, global force. How do we address it? They reconvene. AKA China. You feel me? How do we reconvene? How do we turn these other Asian nations against China and develop the military alliance to attack China? When they have these forums, like the, the G7 forum, where you have uh, the United States and Italy and Germany and France uh, coming together to plan global expansion. Right when they have the G20 summit, where you get the 20 richest nations plus the European Union coming together, they're not just talking about wins. They're talking about we taking losses over here, bro. What can we do to, to, make to figure shift. this out? So, we so for us, we have to take the same approach, right? This is why Kwame Teresa is why every day I'm telling black people they are beautiful. Black people, we can come together. Black people, we will win because you got to have that hope. You got you got to have that hope. The colonizer has the hope against all odds. We got to have that, right? We got to uh, have that belief. You know, and so I, I would say learning your history puts your struggle in the context, and it's not to uh, it's not to say like, oh, I shouldn't feel like yeah, p- things hurt, man. You know, like yeah, you mm-hmm. might not be sitting in solitary confinement, but you figuring out how the fuck you gonna make rent, or you having issues with self worth, or no matter you know like that's a very real thing. Yeah. But understand that that don't gotta be, that ain't gotta be fatal. There's you gotta you gotta find your strength from somewhere, and for me, it comes from understanding history. When I understand that. Uh, you know, Sophia Bakari was in maximum security. When I understand that Asado was in the bottom of a, of men's, a men's prison. prison. When I understand that Matulu, because of organizing work that he was that he was doing with Tupac Shakur, was sent to Colorado and then placed was sent to the one of the 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 most maximum security prisons that the United States has to offer, and then was put at the bottom of that motherfucker. Come on, D, you you could. <laughs> Tighten up. You can Let's figure this it. out, bro. We're going to figure it out. You can figure this shake. out. You can <laughs> figure this out, bro. You up against what they was up against, with, but you got certain resources. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, it just put that in the context. And so I say, that's how we develop. Mm-hmm. In short, if I can give you the three bullet points again, it's teaching the people their history, a correct, objective version of history, revolutionary history. That alone will lead to people wanting to figure out how they can get involved in a real way. And understanding that history puts your struggle in the context. And so I say teaching our people and then embodying what we learn is how we can uh is how we can develop that uh spirit of struggle throughout uh time. Yeah. And across the nation. The new African nation. Nah, straight up. Because once that spirit is built, that's how everything moves forward. <laughs> you feel me? Where it's like this becomes a part of a Revolutionary ethos, revolutionary morals, you feel me? Mm-hmm. To where we could actually uh, establish revolutionary consciousness. And we could establish revolutionary consciousness. Then the next step, we're going <laughs> to free the land. You know what I'm saying? If we have that mass consciousness of the people, we have that national unity that's developed, seeing we was governing ourselves, all mm-hmm. right? We're going to fight for that naturally. Then we can actually really have new African culture. We can really have a real, uh, a real nation, you feel me? That honors all the people who made the sacrifices, the ultimate sacrifices for it to exist. Uh, so you mentioned it a little bit earlier around uh, like health issues. And so we've seen health issues take the lives of our soldiers in the movement. Um, do you believe this to be a result of intelligence operations? You know, people want to say sometimes you go into discussions like this that you're having conspiracy theories and that you're uh, you know we shouldn't talk about these things and that what happened happened but uh yes i do and i think there's evidence to show that the cia is part of the way they operate you feel me if we understand that the u.s government will do anything and everything to maintain its control that we understand the chemical warfare that is being used the the, the biological warfare the we're talking about nuclear bombs. We're talking about AI. We're talking about all this technology that the United States has. Do we think that the U.S. government itself isn't purposely trying to kill people through using certain diseases to assassinate people to make it look like and nothing happened? Right. If we look at uh, all the assassination attempts, attempts on Fidel Castro, like one time he got he got sick, like from something where he had like this like sickness that he got. You feel me? After he attended like a conference. You feel me? So it was like all these assassination attempts. What did we think was happening? You feel me? Uh, if we look at uh, Ibrahim uh, Franz Omar Fanon, uh, he was ultimately brought to the 
United States by the CIA, right, to get health work done. As soon as he gets to the U.S., eight weeks later, he he dies. So and then we look at it. We have no CIA files. You feel me? Nothing has been shown on him. You know what I'm saying? We have no no type of papers. There was someone who tried to get some of the FBI files. You can't find any of the F- FBI files. So he just mysteriously got sick at that time period when a lot of leaders was mysteriously getting sick. You had a, a Hugo Chavez uh, mysteriously get sick. You know what I'm saying? Where people in his country alleged, oh, no, this was a result of the CIA. If we know they they type of warfare is to make it look like, oh, something natural happened, right? We have Bob Marley. Bob Marley, the, the CIA, a CIA agent on his deathbed said, I killed Bob Marley. You feel me? That is just like pretty much, oh, it's a conspiracy. Like when you have the CIA agent admit to it on his deathbed. They always admit to the work. You feel me? They, like that's, that's part of their signature is you feel me? They will show signs of what they are doing and not say, oh, we can neither confirm nor deny. Right, <laughs> so we have Bob Marley. That happened to Bob Marley, right? Um, the CIA admitted to it. What did he die of? So we understand that these biological warfare can be used, in my opinion. Well, that, Bob that is Marley. A, that is a fact. If we see the CIA approve it, and then you see the articles on it, you know what I'm saying? Like that's their signature. <laughs> that's part of part of the way they do it, right? So when I think about this question of it being used. On our political prisoners and prisoners of war behind bars, yes. If we understand for sure that uh, even being behind bars and the lack of health care, that is part of chemical warfare. That is part of, like, scientific warfare. Mm-hmm. You feel me? You're thinking about even the materials that is used in prisons, you know what I'm saying, and how health uh, complications can come from uh, certain uh, materials that is being made to use prisons that was designed to essentially give people cancer, Right. Even if we look at, and this is where I come in, like then think about this concept of martyrdom. Like you dying behind bars from a um, from health diseases, you feel me? That is a part of the struggle. That's to me, you a martyr. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, do you a martyr because of that? Like even uh, uh, France Fanon, he's buried in the the grave of martyrs in uh, Algeria. Mm-hmm. So it was like people understood at that time period that nah, the CIA is doing these certain things to our people. It's very plausible. <laughs> Very plausible that this is a part of the warfare as well. Mm-hmm. It's part of the warfare, so I, I would say yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. They've shown no matter what way you take it, whether it's being incarcerated and being denied health access, that is part of the health neglect that is slowly killing someone. That is part of genocide. how do you monitor someone that's being put at the Bakari, bottom of a jail? You know what I'm saying, and, and being in, in, in max. You know what I'm saying, and not having the right access to healthcare that is a part of slowly killing someone so that's why I say I consider Sophia Bacardi to be a martyr she I had consider to have a Matul Shakur to be a martyr yeah. you feel me like, so I think it's, it's important we understand that uh, the devilish ways of warfare by the Central Intelligence Agency the FBI and the so called US government I consider anyone who's been a known target of US intelligence agencies their death to be a result of uh, that repression and oppression, period, point blank. So how do we understand death then as it relates to the movement and people making that ultimate sacrifice? Well, first, we got to realize that death is the only thing that's promised after birth. I think once you start to change your relationship to, to death, uh, the way you look at it, it can alleviate some of the pressure once you make that conscious decision to combat the colonial, racist, capitalist, imperialist forces by any means necessary, right? And so in the context of movements, again, anytime Africans have stood up to colonial reactionary forces, we've been met with the threat of death. Um, But uh, honestly, I think Africans who stand on principles live forever. Look how many people that aren't here in the physical form that who we named today alone. (laughs) <laughs> you go into the People's Programs Warehouse, we got, uh, by no means is that list exhaustive because all the rank and file martyrs who exist, uh, whether it was in Nat Turner's Rebellion, whether it was in the Haitian Revolution, <laughs> whether it was... You know, all the martyrs are the names that we don't even know. You feel Spirit me? is still... <laughs> they live on. And still is living within us as we organize. They, they, they live on. And so... Uh, Africans who stand on principles or shit, whether we talk about my great grandpa, who for all I know never did no quote unquote uh, 
conscious revolutionary act against the state, but just the way that he stood on business for his family. Martyr. Or uh, live forever, I should say. Live forever. You know what I'm saying? And so Africans who stand on principles, we don't die. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, when it comes to, to death in the movement, like Huey said in Revolutionary Suicide, he accepted, he understood that a, a death for the people was a, a death much better than choosing to just die by the hands of the state and not fight, and not fight back. You know, because we're going to go regardless in the conditions that they're creating for us where uh, since 1950, the black population in this country has grown from 15 million to 40 million. Right? We live in genocidal conditions why the white population has grown by 100 million, while the Hispanic population has went from 2 to 60. All right? it's, it's clear that what we live in, the conditions that we live in as New Africans is genocidal. So we're going to die regardless. We might as well uh, die for the people. And even like I was telling in Cadre 3, I'm like, man, I don't even... I'm not, not, I would not consider myself a martyr by any means if I was to die today or whatever, but I know the way that I've treated my family, like, I'm going to live forever. I, I'm good. The way that I rock for my nieces and nephews and my siblings and my grandparents, like, well, I don't got nothing to worry about. I'm going to be here. I know they're going to be talking about me at cookouts forever, bro. Like, that's just that's just what it is because I just stood on principles and I just stood on business. And so when you talk about doing something that impacts the masses of people, come on, man. You're you, you going to be good. And so I think death is the last thing we should worry about because it's already promised. It's just already promised. And so I think you should be worried about how you live, right? That's what George said. I'm not, I'm not concerned with how long I live, but how well I live. And so I'm concerned, and I think all Africans should be concerned with the impact we have on this world. And that impact is a byproduct of the way that we treat the people we come in contact with on a daily basis and the principles and morals that we decide to stand on. And folks like El Haj, Malik El Shabazz, folks like Martin Luther King, so folks like Sophia Bakari, folks like Huey P. Newton, uh, folks like uh, Kambozi Amistad, Masai Elosi, uh, folks like Matulu, folks like Tupac, folks like Asin, uh, Afini, you know, folks like Sanyika. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, you know, they understood that. And so. They live forever. Straight up. <laughs> Straight up, especially if we understand them as martyrs. You feel me? Like, they live it on. Mm -hmm. Like, Matulu, Haj Malik, Ibrahim, Franz Omar Fanon, you feel me? Sophia Bakari, Sheikh Nub, all these martyrs of the movement, all these martyrs uh, live on. Mm -hmm. So, if we don't, we don't see it as death. <laughs> We don't see it as death because we know they live in. We know yeah. their spirit is alive. We know their spirit of struggle is guiding us. You feel me? It's guiding us through our actions today, through organizing, through the way we is thinking, through the way we is attempting to build. You feel me? So how can we say they die? Like you said, all we, the one promise we have is death. You feel me? And if we want to avenge our martyrs too, we have to also accept, in my opinion, we have to live like a martyr. <laughs> you feel me? That's that's the lesson they teach me is okay, live like a martyr. Have no fear. Have no only, you know, only fear God. Have no fear of them taking my flesh because they take my flesh, whatever. <laughs> I'm still living. I'm still here. You know what I'm saying? And I think throughout the whole black liberation movement, the new African independence movement, we've seen, like you said, Huey was talking about in Revolutionary Suicide. Uh, we talk about uh, Huey Newton uh, when he gave the eulogy for George Jackson. He said, George Jackson, even after his death, you see, is going on living in a very real way because after all, the greatest thing that we have is the idea and our spirit because it can be passed on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you feel me? So this concept of martyrdom has been within the movement for generations. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, what for him to say, uh, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. Mm -hmm. That's implying that you can kill a revolutionary, but that spirit of the revolutionary lives on through the, re through the revolution. Yeah. You feel me? So like these people who made the ultimate sacrifice who were martyred, they accepted death. Didn't mean they wasn't looking for it just at that moment, but they had to accept it. Which is why, you know, we, we feel sadness. Of course, that's a natural part, but we should also uh, should celebrate them. We should honor them. You feel me? Because they made that willful decision mm -hmm. to engage in a certain way, you know. So we should celebrate that life. <laughs> We should honor that life. You know, shed a, shed some tears if we need to. 
But ultimately, like, they made that decision. So for me, I, I feel like when I think about Matu, I feel a great sense of respect for him. I feel mm-hmm. a, a great uh, sense of honor to even know his story. You feel me? And knowing that he made that conscious decision to live and engage and to live like a martyr, that means to me, like, I, I got to tighten myself up. I got to make myself... Like okay, I say yeah. Don't don't be don't fear death. All right, how do I further believe that every day? How do I further <laughs> liberate myself? You feel me? Like he liberated himself from this idea of this world. Like nah, I'm gonna struggle in this world as much as I can, but I know I got something next for me, mm-hmm. and I know my spirit finna live forever. Long live the martyrs. Yes, Lord, avenge them. Inshallah. <laughs>